And as people are coming in, uh, I will welcome you. My name is Tom Harmon, uh, Senior Director of Development for the Friedman Brain Institute, and that includes uh, the Bonnie and Tom Strauss Movement Disorders Center, which is presenting this webinar today. On the screen is a flow code, uh, kind of a fancy QR code. Uh, if you're so motivated, uh, we'll put this up at the end of the webinar as well. And you can point your smartphone at it and be able to make a donation to these amazing faculty that are presenting to us today. So it is 4.02, so, and I think we have a, I've seen a slowing down of people entering the webinar. So thank you all again for joining us. Uh, and without further ado, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Susan Bressman. She is the Merkin Family Chair, the Director of the Bonnie and Tom Strauss Movement Disorders Center, and Professor of Neurology here at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Thank you so much, Dr. Bressman. And thank you. And greetings and welcome to all um, listening in to us today. This is our second webinar and hopefully a yearly tradition. Um, and um, I'm just glad to welcome you all as we are hopefully emerging from COVID. Last webinar was really embedded in thoughts about that. Um, but despite COVID and the last year that we've had, our center, the Bonnie uh, and Tom Strauss Center is bigger and better than ever. So I'm gonna start by giving folks a little overview about our numbers um, and how active we are. So in 2021, we had over 11,000 visits, including almost 1,800 new patient visits. Those are patients that are new to our group. And that activity is actually ahead of 2019 pre-COVID by many hundreds of visits. So, you know, I'm very happy with how busy we were in 2021, despite Omicron and all the, all the craziness we were going through. We also grew our team. We now have a total of 10 neurologists. One started in September, Vicki Katz-Nelson, a former fellow, a fabulous clinician. And one is starting in June, Emmanuel During, who has expertise in sleep. He comes to us from Stanford. So sort of a, a unique skill set. We've had four fellows this year. We're gonna have five in July. And we can talk a little bit if we have any time about our fellowships, but they're a real, as, as any patient who's ever visit us, visited us knows, um, they're just a great, wonderful component of what we do and how we take care of patients. So we have our fellows, we have two psychiatrists, two neuropsychologists, two genetic counselors, four nurse practitioners, and we hope to build our nurse practitioner group. Um, so it's a really big group spread out over three sites. Um, we also have a very diverse patient population, Parkinson's, dystonia, and tremor make up most of our patient population, but we see we do see a significant number of patients with ticks, Tourette's, Korea, like Huntington's disease, um, gait disorders, ataxia, we can talk about that. So we see a very diverse patient population and diverse both in terms of you know the locations we see from all over the world and all over the United States and New York City, but also diverse in terms of socioeconomic, ethnicity, and, and we, we can talk a little bit about that in terms of how important that is um, in terms of the service we provide in New York City, but also the research that we do. Um, so our research, we're gonna talk a lot about research today. In fact, that's what today's topic is. It's an update um, on our research activities. Our research portfolio has grown about 30% of what our center does total is related to research activity. And we do translational research, and you're gonna hear about that and what that means, and also clinical trials where we, uh, patients are invited in to try new therapies. Um, we have many funders, NIH, Michael J. Fox Foundation, Parkinson's Foundation, New York State, drug companies, Biogen, we have a very interesting new study starting um, that's funded by Denali Biogen. And of course, philanthropy, which uh, really helps us um, in many ways, uh, which if we have time at the end, we can talk about how philanthropy is important to our research endeavors. Um, you're gonna hear 
uh, more about the specific activities from Dr. Saunders Pullman, Dr. Peter, and Dr. Menes Shahed, and I'll introduce them. Uh, I'll introduce them in a little bit. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a, an update about our center um, and what we've been doing. We've been working hard to um, establish processes um, so that we can unify ourselves. You know, being at three sites, um, it's not always easy. Each site has its own specific needs. So we, and, and research is going on in all three sites. So we work together, we have working groups that bring us together so we can talk about our common activities and bring ourselves together. Hopefully soon, these have all been Zoom, but hopefully some of this will become personal. We're you know, face-to-face -face soon and we're looking forward to that. We've also been green-lighted to build out our space. This is critical. So we are at three sites now, but we have this very big space on the west side near Mount Sinai West that we'll be building out soon. Um, hopefully looking at those preliminary floor plans, we're going to have a big piece of this devoted to our center. And we're very excited to be able to expand what we do under this new roof. Um, we're especially looking at um, how we can build our multidisciplinary care. I mean, right now we pride ourselves on being a very integrated group with genetic counseling, neuropsychology, psychiatry. We have physical therapists, speech therapists, occupational therapists we turn to, but we want to expand what we do. As many of you know, especially for Parkinson's, we can have issues and we're going to hear about it, bowel, bladder issues, um, blood pressure issues that can be really uh, very disabling. So um, cognitive issues. So we want to bring our center, we want to bring this expertise into our center so that when we have a patient with um, a really important, let's say, GI issue related to their Parkinson's disease, we actually have expertise or urologic problems, very important. So we don't wanna, we wanna be able to make sure we're integrated and we provide that kind of special care that our patients need. So, okay, so today we're gonna hear about our research and I, I won't talk, I won't try to tell you what these guys are gonna be telling you about, but you should know that a key part of our center right from the very beginning uh, Dr. Saunders Pullman knows this because she came here from Columbia with me right from the beginning, um, was integrating research into our clinical space. That was a key piece of what we did. So that when patients come in, we really offer all our patients the opportunity to participate, whether it's an observational biomarker trial where we we don't intervene with a special therapy, but we collect blood samples and urine and stool and spinal fluid <laughs> and anything else, anything else we can sample and gather a lot of data. And actually we use all this to try to figure out the cause of people's problem. This is, if it's dystonia, Parkinson's disease. So collecting all this information is really important. And then we're really keen on making sure that our patients have the opportunity to participate in clinical trials. That's really important to, to what we do. So that is an, that's our translational research sort of uh, model that we, want, we have now, but we wanna make even better when we move to our new space. Um, the other piece that I wanna mention, and Dr. Peter is gonna, Peter's gonna talk about this more, is because we're clinicians and because we think we know so much about our patients, we use that information to help us figure out etiology and treatments. So as we know, as we've learned, I mean, dystonia is a symptom, many causes, many genes. Parkinson's disease, which used to be thought of as this monolithic single disease, we now know is heterogeneous. It isn't one disease. And there are different genes. Um, there can be differing circuitry. There's different pathology even. So we've learned this over the years and we know that means that we'll have to personalize the treatment too. 
and it's and individualize it as we learn more about etiology. And you're going to hear more about that. So without further ado, I'm always still everybody's time here. Um, I'll tell you about our three speakers. We're going to hear from Dr. Saunders Pullman. She um, oversees our research endeavors. Um, she is an incredible investigator. She's been continually funded by NIH and also New York State and various private foundations. And she's been incredibly productive in figuring out this heterogeneity in figuring out causes of dystonia and Parkinson's disease and the clinical spectrum. And also, and she's gonna talk about this biomarkers, the, what we can determine in these various samples that lets us figure out disease mechanisms, causes, but also how we track disease. You know, if we give a treatment, is it getting into the brain? Is it, is it getting to that target? And then how is it affecting disease course? Are people staying the same? Are they getting worse? Are they getting better? So figuring all that out, that's what Rachel does. Um, then we're gonna hear from Dr. Inga Peter and she's really a powerhouse. She's amazing. She's a highly creative researcher. She's trained as a geneticist, but we're making her a gut doctor of PD. No, she's gonna tell you all about it. She's focused on inflammatory bowel diseases and she has been, and she recognized that there were genetic links between bowel, inflammatory bowel disorders and Parkinson's. Very creatively brought these two together, is really doing cutting edge work, illuminating this gut brain axis and the role of inflammation. And she's gonna talk about it. And then finally, we're gonna hear from Dr. Jui Jimenez Shahet. And she's also another amazing woman who has the very tough job of running our DBS program. It's a very busy, complex program, coordinating assessments from multiple clinicians. And she's done an amazing job improving our program. And she's pursuing all sorts of interesting research approaches to uh, improving our outcomes in DBS and innovative ways of how we assess that. And she's gonna be talking about that. So I will stop and go right on to Rachel before I take up all the time. That's fine, thank you. And let me just make sure. Are you guys able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, super. So thank you for your very kind introduction, Dr. Bressman, and thank you all for taking the time to join. Um, I'm going to quickly set the backdrop for some of the recent advances and challenges in Parkinson's, and in the brief time I have, uh, how we're trying to address and overcome some of these challenges. And then I'll speak a little bit about dystonia and some exciting prospects that are in development. And one way to think about Parkinson's is to think about what we can do for symptoms um, that we heard about over here, and then also what we can do to restore lost cells and stop the progression of Parkinson's to stop further cell loss. And these are demarcated in the green, and that's what we call disease-modifying therapies. And it's really a special time in Parkinson's because we have this huge array of new therapies to treat the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. And I've highlighted a few of these, but overall, the major medication to treat Parkinson's is levodopa. And this is the medication that gets converted to dopamine. And in the picture on the left, we see this is really a core feature of Parkinson's. And, um, and I've actually um, highlighted here um, the dark cells that uh, manufacture the dopamine and how they are, uh, there are many less and this cell loss with Parkinson's. And um, our challenge is uh, after people have had Parkinson's for several years, um, that fine tuning the medication is necessary as the sensitivity of the medication changes. And in green, I've highlighted uh, some of the new medications that help extend the effect of levodopa, including a picapone, which is a long acting COMT inhibitor, and also excitingly, uh, estradefeline, H2A antagonist, um, which has an 
a different mechanism of action. And we also have these two long acting forms of amantadine to quiet the dyskinesias or excess movements. And we have new methods as far as getting levodopa into the bloodstream, including inhalation under the tongue dosing. And some of you have heard about DIVI, which is really more um, regular levodopa, but allowing perhaps slightly more accurate delivery because we can do smaller doses. But most exciting to me, I wanted to highlight, is um, work that two of my colleagues are involved with. And these are trials for um, a continuous levodopa infusion in the form of a patch pump. Um, and these are my colleagues, Uptown Dr. Winona C. and with us at Union Square, uh, Dr. Matt Swan. And really, I think this is an extraordinarily promising symptomatic medicine as it finally allows us to more closely mimic the way the body um, allow, makes its own dopamine and um, how the dopamine is delivered through the day. And it begins to harness a technology of pump infusions that has been in the work it works for diabetes for a while. And then finally, we have exciting new types of deep brain stimulation, which Dr. Jimenez Shahed will talk about shortly. But we have two overarching challenges, which are focus of clinical translational research at Sinai. One is already alluded to by Dr. Bressman, which is down uh, in the lower right, this dark blue, that we really need to address the non-motor features of Parkinson's that are not necessarily remedied with levodopa-related medications or surgery. And in particular, as was highlighted, some people with Parkinson's develop cognitive decline, confusion, significant anxiety, depression, blood pressure drops, some people develop severe gastrointestinal or urologic problems and other sleep issues. And these are important, these non-motor features in two ways. Of course, most importantly, um, we need to have better treatments for these because they can significantly impact quality of life. And they're also key to consider because they may be related to how Parkinson's develops and they may even provide roots for understanding and combating the neurodegeneration in Parkinson's. And um, we'll hear about um, constipation and GI and how that relates from Dr. Peter. And, uh, oops, just a minute. Oh. Little glitch there, sorry about that. Um, and then I also want to highlight uh, sleep. And we recently received NIH funding for a pilot study relating to sleep. Sleep is important not only because the brain is making dopamine at night, and if we're awake uh, and not sleeping, we're using up the dopamine, and there may be less of our own natural endogenous dopamine in the morning. It's also important um, because, and also of course, we don't wanna be fatigued during the day, um, but in resetting the body's natural clock or the circadian rhythm, um, improving sleep can, has the potential to improve the daytime function. Um, and some of this is related to theories that this natural circadian rhythm uh, is important because some of the body's mechanisms for clearing of alpha-synuclein, uh, a toxic protein that builds up in Parkinson's um, as in the brain, as well as in other body regions, um, these, um, that the um, circadian rhythm can affect how the alpha-synuclein is processed. And there are some theories that uh, the recycling units, the lysosomes that break down the synuclein may be affected by sleep cycles. They may not be working 24 seven, but may be happening once a day, more like we don't take out the trash every hour, we might take it out once a day. And if we upset this daily circadian rhythm, then we might be impairing the lysosomes. And we're very excited to be working with our collaborator, uh, Mariana Figueroa, from the Lighting Research Institute, um, not only to quantify measures of sleep and circadian rhythm in Parkinson's, which we still need to understand better, but also uh, to be testing uh, pilot light therapy that is built into the environment and is overall very well tolerated. And as a clinician, I'm really excited to be able to offer the lighting intervention trial um, because um, 
It allows us to uh, single arm so nobody gets placebo to um, give people the opportunity to have the lights uh, to work to reset the uh, circadian rhythm. And her team is installing the lights for month long periods in people's home. And um, if you're interested, I put a contact uh, at the end. And then, um, as we mentioned, um, constipation, GI issues. Um, we'll hear from Dr. Peter, who is understanding both the microbiome and gut and inflammation uh, in Parkinson's. And um, in parallel, not only will improving gut transit improve medication absorption and comfort, but it also provides a window into modifying the progression of Parkinson's. And then the really, um, this presents sort of the other major challenge other than the non-motor is really the very important issue about what do we have for neurorestorative and um, neuroprotective therapies that will slow the cell loss and degeneration. And we've already had several major trials that were not successful. And one of the things that Dr. Bressman alluded to, and we think maybe one of the reasons that we haven't been successful is that we've been treating Parkinson's as if it's just one thing caused by one cause. And indeed, there are different subgroups, many different causes, and these may contribute differently person to person. And in this slide, I show a schema from Clemens Scherzer's group that shows in a hypothetical study to reduce, uh, to improve cognition that um, with a particular mutation in GBA, that actually by limiting to the subgroup, we can have only need to enroll 36 people in each arm compared to a bigger study uh, if we took an unselected group, which would take 900 people. And as you can gather, this would mean that the study would be done more efficiently uh, and hopefully pharma would be willing to take more risks with the study. So uh, we hope that in unraveling the causes, we'll not only have more efficient trials that will increase our odds for success, but we'll have cocktails that will really be more tailored to individual people. So we're seeing a shift in looking at the genetics even more and hopefully towards this personalized approach. But it's even more nuanced than we realize in that only about 30% of people with LARC2 mutation, one of the major Parkinson's mutation, develop Parkinson's by the age of 70. So the question is, what are the other genetic and environmental factors and other factors that increase their risk because we wanna modify those? And excitingly, what are the factors that protect some carriers from developing Parkinson's and how do we harness these? And these can also be environmental, genetic, or even sex and hormone related. And uh, we developed this NIH study, which we call BioPD, which is focused on the idea that um, the reason that many people, even with known genes, never develop Parkinson's is explained because there are many genes or oligogenic. And these genes not only are important for uh, people with LARC2 and GBA, but we hypothesize that they may be important for people without LARC2 and GBA mutations as well. And some of the genes that we are looking at relate to major factors that are um, emerging as really important themes in Parkinson's, uh, the inflammation uh, and the immune system, the lysosomal system, the part of the cell that works on recycling and processing proteins, and um, the lysosome really is a major player in Parkinson's related to mutations in GBA or glucosuperosidase. And not only are gene therapies being tested, but we're realizing that the pathway is also involved in a group of people without GBA mutations as well. So we wanna learn which ones. We're also um, excited that data that we've generated uh, about um, LARC2 and the progression, which Dr. Bressman mentioned, is being uh, utilized to help inform the design of trials for a LARC2 related agent that will be launched shortly. And all of our work involves extensive national international collaboration. And so um, we're collecting uh, samples and many of you are part of this study and patiently working with Dr. Bressman, Debbie Raymond, our genetic counselor and our wonderful extensive research team that I haven't shown here. Um, we are collecting samples and these are shared with the NIH so that these can be more widely used and understood. Um, 
And then our collaborator at the uh, Mass General, um, Dr. Laurie Ozelius, along with Aloy Domingo, are working on genetic analyses. We're focused primarily on uh, Ashkenazi Jews for the reason that um, there is less heterogeneity, and so it's easier to find a signal in our particular population. But then we are uh, planning to then go forward and do replication in people without uh, Jewish ancestry as well. And um, because of COVID, I think across the board, there's more understanding of the importance of the immune system and that inflammation may affect the development and progression of disease. And we're working um, with our colleague, uh, Dr. Tofi Graj, who takes samples we collect and um, actually uh, separates out the um, particular immune cells called monocytes um, in looking at inflammatory markers and genes that uh, may modify uh, Parkinson's. And we'll also hear about another direction of inflammation from Dr. Peter shortly. So, um, and um, well, there really isn't time to go over too much specifics of the research, uh, and I'm under orders to limit the time. I, I wanted to mention another non-motor avenue we are utilizing to understand subgroups and progression of Parkinson's uh, into the brain, which is olfaction or smell. And I'm showing here the scratch and sniff, sniff tests we use and data from paper that was actually accepted today into neurology, showing that um, two major things. One is that even within LARC 2 PD, um, that the, there is a diversity of smell scores and smell is uh, rated from zero to 40 as far as the correct responses. And we see even in, uh, this is idiopathic PD, people with Parkinson's without mutations, uh, that there is some range there as well. And what we report in our paper is that the um, baseline olfactory score is associated with the age and onset of Parkinson's and also with progression of Parkinson's. And I wanted to make sure I had time for dystonia. And while we address dystonia, we're facing different issues in that most dystonia is not neurodegenerative. Uh, it is, as Dr. Pressman mentioned, a very heterogeneous. And um, the focus though is on treatment of symptoms as well as the underlying dystonia. And uh, while treatment with botulinum toxin, the chemo chemodenervation is key to treatment of dystonia that affects one part of the body or where one part is especially troublesome, there is some exciting progress with the new form of toxin, the daxybotulinum toxin. There's also progress um, in anticholinergics, which may be helpful uh, in some types, many types of dystonia, but have been very much limited because um, we're too indiscriminately blocking the acetylcholine receptor. We're not there, but I think it's a tremendous um, avenue as far as pushing things forward. But in other ways, uh, our challenges are similar to Parkinson's in that the personalized approach really is key. And our center led by Dr. Bressman and the dystonia research has been steadfastly committed to understand the genetics of dystonia and in doing so, um, how this may lead to new therapies. And I wanna highlight that we now have windows that offer insight into different forms of dystonia. And some of our focus is on these particular neurotransmitters. Um, and this slide emphasizes some of these, including where the major dystonia genes and research led by Dr. Bressman, and Dr. Azilius, including DIT1A, uh, DIT1, TOR1A dystonia, um, BAP1, uh, uh, DIT6, and some of the others, rapid onset dystonia, Parkinson's, GNAL, and linkage to SGC, how these fit in. And excitingly, more recently, uh, discovered uh, VPS16 gene and the HOPS complex, um, which brings us back to the question uh, that we brought up before as the lysosome, and this may play a role in dystonia uh, more than we had realized before. And we really have a lot more to do because with the exception of the dopaminergic system and dopa response of dystonia, we don't have specific targeted medicines. And we do think that discovering new genes, particularly those related to torticollis or cervical dystonia and blepharospasm will help. We're also interested in dystonia from a larger so-called 
circuits approach and overcoming many of the barriers to understanding uh, who responds to deep brain stimulation and why. And we'll hear more about this from Dr. Jimenez Shahed. This shows just some of the recent publications we've been involved in. So um, I realize I've gone over with my time and I've only given some highlights and I hope that I will have conveyed that um, there has been significant progress. Um, there are many challenges ongoing and ahead, but we are hopeful and excited to break down barriers and come up with solutions. And before I introduce Dr. Peter, I want to express my tremendous thanks to Bonnie and Tom Strauss, who have established the Movement Disorder Center and the many others who have supported our research, participated in studies. It takes a village and we are very grateful. Um, so further in that regard, I want to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Inga, Inga Peter, who's professor of genetics at Mount Sinai. And uh, Dr. Bressman may give more titles, um, but she's been a guiding light as well as a tremendous advocate in helping us obtain and analyze data from the immense um, BioPD, BioMe um, genetics project. And, um, and then another one of her tremendous achievements is related to Crohn's. And if you wanted to partner with us and her and donate stool, and if you're having a colonoscopy at Sinai, I um, would be willing to share biopsy uh, tissue. I had um, given some links there and perhaps then um, somebody, I think they're not on the screen. Wait, did we lose this? Sorry about this. Let me stop sharing. And then um, I don't know if I did this or not. Sorry about that. Let me. Um, so these are some links and, uh, if you want to reach out and then also some links about the, um, the sleep study and for dystonia. So and we thank can, you all and, so much. And we can share those links in a, a follow-up email as well. So I think okay. we can move on to Dr. Okay. Peter. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so very much, Rachel and Susan for your kind introduction. Um, I'm really delighted uh, to, to be here. I will share a few slides and um, it will um, it tell the story uh, that um, describes my work. So I, I just wanted to start by, say, by saying that uh, around the time I, um, I just graduated from my PhD in 2000, when I came across this um, picture, and uh, that was taken by a professional photographer who took 2,000 pictures uh, from a people in a small village in England. And what, what uh, we're looking at is actually double portraits of 12 people. And in the middle is the image that uh, he slowly morphed all of these uh, images into one image. And um, what, what came across my mind was that this actually not a real person. This is just an average person across 2,000 different uh, images. But when we look at our current uh, uh, medical care, we're all treated as uh, with the average um, uh, therapies, with something that uh, shows average response or um, uh, people who uh, demonstrate some, some average biomarkers. And then I realized that in order to really achieve a significant improvement in medicine, we need to treat a person and not necessarily a disease. And that's where my uh, passion um, comes from when I really try to address uh, the, uh, the clinical research in my, in, in my work. So um, my uh, research actually has been focused on inflammatory bowel disease up until about four or five years ago, um, where we uh, studied uh, the risk of Crohn's disease. And Crohn's disease is a, a type of inflammatory bowel disease that is a chronic uh, disease of the uh, gut associated with uh, excessive immune response to uh, good uh, bacteria in the body. It just misrecognizes a good bacteria, takes it for pathogen and starts attacking it. And it, the own immune system attacks it so much that it causes damage to the gut and eventually to chronic inflammation 
that become so intense that the process is irreversible. And this is what we call inflammatory bowel disease. There is no cure, but there are some therapies that allow to, to keep it in uh, remission. So we, our goal was to study uh, novel genetic factors that lead to uh, inflammatory bowel disease, because we know that understanding the genetics will eventually lead us to novel therapies. And we were extremely surprised when we were um, analyzing our results that one of our top hits was a LARC2 gene. And even we, you know, in the field of IBD knew that LARC2 was a major risk factor for Parkinson's disease. But it was very difficult for us to believe that these two uh, seemingly unrelated diseases can be, you know, connected genetically. And we, uh, it took us two years to really prove that LARC2 indeed is the risk factor for Crohn's disease. And that's how this uh, 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 entire line of research started. And actually, when we uh, um, uh, analyzed our data, we went back and we realized that the idea of the gut-brain axis is not new. It's been described many, many years ago and decades ago. And it infers to the fact that there is a bi uh, a directional relationship between the gut and the brain. And that works through the, when we have uh, 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 changes in the mood, uh, it impacts our gut and vice versa. When we have an upset gut, we, have, uh, uh, we can be depressed and we can have other uh, 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 changes in the brain. But the uh, mechanism, how it all happens, is still largely unknown. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to uh, really solve this puzzle piece by piece. And I will share with you just a few of our major findings and how they can impact the field of Parkinson's disease. So initially what we found was, that was very interesting, is that it turns out that people with inflammatory bowel disease are at increased risk of developing Parkinson's disease, about 30 to 40%. And these results hold up in, in the entire world. The papers that came out from Denmark and Sweden and Taiwan and China have shown that patients with inflammatory bowel disease and intestinal inflammation are at higher risk of developing Parkinson's disease. What also was really interesting is that if uh, inflammatory bowel disease, disease patients were exposed to anti-inflammatory therapy earlier in life, they were actually protected against Parkinson's disease. And the protection was significant. It was about 78% decrease in the risk of Parkinson's disease, indicating that controlling intestinal inflammation early in life could be a potential strategy to prevent or postpone Parkinson's disease in people at high risk of developing Parkinson's disease. Another observation that we uh, uh, um, uh, not noticed was that the newer drugs that are now being considered to treat Parkinson's disease, which are LARC2 inhibitors, are actually uh, uh, able to reduce the colitis, to mitigate, to rescue colitis in uh, animal models, further suggesting the strong link between intestinal inflammation, chronic inflammation, and Parkinson's disease. And the last and probably most exciting uh, side of this research is the new developments in the field of uh, microbiome. And uh, the microbiome is considered to be a, a combination of all the bacteria that lives in our body, which out, uh, numbers uh, human genes uh, by uh, many thousands. And these bacteria play uh, a very important um, beneficial roles in our body. They fight uh, pathogens, they, they involve in the development of the immune system, they protect our gut from uh, a, a different uh, interventions, and uh, all these functions are very important. And it's been shown for, for, for years now that uh, patients with inflammatory bowel disease have significant dysbiosis, they have lower bacterial diversity, and they also have a lot of pro-inflammatory bacteria. But it's been 
really recently, only a few years since we realized that the bi microbiome of patients with Parkinson's disease is also significantly altered. And while there are only few studies that are currently able to provide some insight into the um, uh, uh, it, 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 microbiome uh, uh, associated with Parkinson's disease, what we learned so far is actually that the pathways involved in the fatty acid um, oxidation are the ones that uh, distinguish between uh, the microbiome of patients with Parkinson's disease and unaffected controls. So uh, I think that the newer uh, direction in the field of Parkinson's disease will definitely go through some kind of uh, manipulation of the microbiome, which is both uh, non-invasive and uh, feasible through diet, through uh, probiotics, prebiotics, supplements, and pot potentially even fecal transplants that have been shown already by a very limited number of studies to improve not just a constipation in patients with Parkinson's disease, but also some symptoms of uh, patients with Parkinson's disease, and definitely should be considered as uh, potential new strategies for disease prevention and disease treatment. And I will um, finish just by showing this um, light bulb where we, uh, we are showing that we have so far been able to identify some uh, switches that allow us to turn on and turn off both Parkinson's disease and Crohn's disease. But going forward, there are so many other uh, avenues where we can use this knowledge and improve the lives of patients with Parkinson's disease through uh, modification of the intestinal inflammation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Peter. Uh, if you could just stop sharing your screen. And we will turn over to Dr. Julia Manish Shahed, who's our medical director for movement disorders, neuromodulation, and brain circuit therapeutics, uh, and associate professor here in neurology and neurosurgery at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Yumena Shahed. Great. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you, Susan, Inga, and Rachel for sharing all your thoughts and for inviting me to join you here today. It's a real pleasure to share some of the information uh, about the program that we've been really uh, developing here in terms of deep brain stimulation. So you've heard uh, a lot of really fascinating information about um, sort of the diagnosis, the prevention, the disease modification, um, characterization, and even personalized medicine in, in patients with Parkinson's and dystonia and other movement disorders. And we're really kind of trying to do similar work on the side of the deep brain stimulation. So for those of you who aren't familiar with deep brain stimulation, it is a surgical standard of care for treatment of many movement disorders. So often patients with Parkinson's or tremor or dystonia who have really not gotten the uh, benefits that they're hoping for from medication, we can really transform lives by moving forward to this type of surgery which can really be a lot better at controlling symptoms without um, having to deal with some of the complications of, of the medication management. So it's a really exciting field. And, and really in the last you know, five to 10 years, we've seen a lot of huge advancements in the technology that's available to us that we can use to really optimize this type of surgical treatment for, uh, for our patients. So it's a, it's a really exciting time to be here. I wanted to share with you three different projects that we're working on in the Mount Sinai uh, Deep Brain Stimulation Program. So the first is a project that I've actually been working on for several years. It's uh, called the Registry for the Advancement of Deep Brain Stimulation in Parkinson's Disease. Um, and this is a project that has been generously funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And it really rose out of an interest in trying to understand why there really are some people who do very well with the surgery, and there might be other people who don't have the same types of experiences and trying to understand what exactly the features are and the dynamics of those differences and outcomes to then be able to go back and say, well, uh, here are some of the best practices that will ensure that all patients have the best chance at getting the best outcome from deep brain stimulation. And so this project uh, started uh, within the Parkinson's study group uh, probably about five or six years ago now. And I'm very proud to say um, that we have in the last couple of years really um, despite COVID, uh, been able to uh, be very successful in subject enrollment for this. Um, and we're, of course, very thankful to all the sites across the country that are participating. We have 20 different sites, um, and we have nearly 300 individuals who have agreed to enroll and participate in the registry. Out of this, we have now about 150 patients on whom we've collected baseline, uh, complete sets of baseline data, which really characterizes their clinical uh, symptoms and their um, not only just from a motor standpoint, but from a non-motor standpoint, 
And then we've also now uh, gotten 84 uh, subjects with complete surgery data sets. So we have a really nice comprehensive um, characterization of the different treatment patterns that these patients are uh, being um, sort of treated with. Um, and lastly, what is most, I think, exciting is that uh, just in the last a few months, we've now started collecting some six-month follow-up data. And so what's really exciting to me about this anyway is that we have the opportunity now to really compare patients who are going through the surgery and understanding why certain features might have been better managed in one patient versus another. Uh, and I think from here on, you know, as we collect more and more data, we're going to have the opportunity to do a lot of these different analyses and then to kind of work with our sites that are participating to then turn that into translational practice um, that ultimately will improve the outcomes of, of patients with deep brain stimulation. So I just wanted to share a little bit of, of that project with you. Um, the second one that we've been working on is actually a little bit of a shift. It's a clinical research project, but it's really more about implementation uh, science. And so uh, some of the um, things that we've learned out of COVID is that we can actually pretty efficiently do uh, telemedicine care for our patients with movement disorders. And some of you who joined us last year may have heard a little bit about uh, these different kind of activities that we're doing. And we have now been able to partner with a company that specializes in the video analysis of movement disorders. Um, and so they're using things like computer vision, software and analysis to really look at the kinematics of patients with movement disorders. And of course that starts with Parkinson's disease Disease, but this can also be applied to tremor and to dystonia. And what's really neat about this is that we have the opportunity to really objectively assess patients from um, you know, the standpoint of the finger tapping and the hand gripping and all of those things that many of you are, are quite familiar with. Um, we can now do that in a more objective way based on the video analysis. And what this actually means is that we can do this remotely. Um, and I've been uh, working with our team here to um, really apply that to the uh, assessment of patients who are candidates for deep brain stimulation. One of the uh, challenges with DBS has always been the access that patients have to the centers that do a lot of DBS so they can get that specialized care and to get good specialized care. And so with this um, video-based analysis, we have a project in which we will be looking to see if that helps us in the standardization of our assessments of our patients, but then also has a module where we can actually allow patients to create their own videos at home and to upload them into the system. And then we can review them uh, separately and do our consultations with them uh, in a manner that is much more efficient than the usual way, which is you have to come into the office, you have to be off your medications, we have to assess your symptoms, we give you your medicines, you wait for them to kick in, we do the whole thing again. Um, and this just really, I think, has the potential to not only streamline our process, but then also to help us be accessible to people, you know, across the street, across the region and perhaps even across the country. Uh, so we're really excited about the progress that we're making in bringing that technology uh, to our DBS program. The third project I wanted to briefly just sort of talk to you about is our efforts at DBS uh, personalization of DBS therapy. And so you've heard a lot about personalization from a genetic standpoint, from a clinical standpoint, from an imaging standpoint, and we can also do this in a deep brain stimulation standpoint. Uh, and one of the things that I've always been very interested in is just the brain signals that we can now record, like real live brain signals from patients with Parkinson's disease that have a lot of uh, opportunities for us to understand disease manifestations. So like which which of these brain signals correlate with which uh, Parkinson's symptoms. We can even do this with dystonia. We can do this with tremor as well. And we've had a tremendous window into this now with the brain sensing technology that's available um, with uh, one of the DBS uh, devices. And we've been doing a lot of work uh, with that device. Um, we can now take the signals that we're recording from the brains of patients in the operating room and we can relate them to the signals that we're seeing uh, outside of the clinic in real life as patients are going around their uh, daily activities and, and sort of relating um, these uh, brain signals to their clinical symptoms and their different manifestations. And we've been learning a lot uh, about how we can apply those uh, different signals to the uh, programming of the deep brain stimulation devices. So for example, if I have a Parkinson's patient and I see a certain uh, type of brain signal called a beta band uh, oscillation, I can actually use the location of that beta band to hone in on where exactly I need to stimulate that patient. And this can actually really shorten the DBS programming time it can also optimize the benefits that patients are getting because not only can we see, you know, symptoms are getting better, but we can also 
also see the brain kind of reacting uh, to these signals. And we can do this with tremor. We can do this with dystonia and Parkinson's. We can do this with dyskinesia. Um, so a lot of uh, really great and, and, and amazing things that we're learning about um, how these brain signals uh, inform us uh, in our treatment approaches uh, to our patients. And I think along with that, we've partnered with a number of different technology companies to really integrate that data. And so all the great work that is being done downtown by Dr. Sanders Pullman and Dr. Bressman and their research teams, we can continue that sort of characterization of patients into the more chronic phases of uh, disease states. And we are aiming to establish a, a physiologic database, a clinical database, and even a circuit database of uh, these patients so we can investigate um, how best to apply that uh, deep brain stimulation electricity uh, to control those symptoms and, and really optimize symptoms for patients. And the way we do that for one person might be different for the way we do it for another person. And we'll have this uh, kind of opportunity to really investigate that and, and dig into it a little bit deeper and, and learn a lot more about um, what we're doing, how we're doing it, and how, how certainly to do it better. So I just uh, hope that was interesting information for you, Tom. That was what I had to share. So I'll pass it back to you. No, thank you so much, Dr. Yemena Shahid. And actually, we have a question in the Q&A uh, for you. Are you considering adding dystonia to your DBS patient registry? That is a fantastic question. And Susan and I have had some wonderful uh, conversations about how to do that and, and whether we can do that. And so the good news is, so the answer is yes, we are considering that and, and we are very interested in um, adding that. The reason being that we have the infrastructure now completely uh, in place. Um, and so it's really just a matter of planning and putting it together and uh, doing the same thing that we did with Parkinson's registry, which is getting it off the ground and, and launching it. So we're very much interested in, in, in getting that started. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, a question that we had received ahead of time, I'll take it to you, Dr. Inga Peter. Yeah, obviously, your work with the gut microbiome and its connection to Parkinson's disease. Uh, folks were asking about the use of probiotics. Do they help with Parkinson's disease at all? And if so, which ones would you recommend? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so there are a number of studies, uh, some clinical trials that have um, used different probiotics, uh, individual uh, uh, bacteria or a combination uh, uh, bacteria uh, in milk and other um, capsules um, have shown that mostly it improves the constipation symptom and not really the, the course of the Parkinson's disease. But these studies were very, very small, and there was only one study out of Iran a few years ago that has shown some improvement in uh, patients uh, in terms of their motor symptoms. It requires much more work, but uh, there, are some, uh, there is a recent study also of uh, PS128, which is mostly um, uh, 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 particular uh, uh, strains that can be used to improve the symptoms, but there is nothing that is really recommended or approved that would definitely uh, uh, should be used uh, currently. It requires much more work. Gotcha, more work to do. Uh, Dr. Bressman, uh, some folks had asked about any connection between dystonia and Parkinson's or essential tremor in Parkinson's. Would you care to comment on that question. So, okay, so those are, I'll try to do this, but it's hard. Okay, so we'll do the dystonia question. So dystonia is a symptom or a sign, not a disease. So when we say somebody has dystonia, we're saying, oh, they've got these involuntary contractions that sort of posture their body or their or their face or their, you know, have trouble writing because the arm is coming up and posturing. So we're describing the movement, the abnormal contra muscle contractions. And the, there are a host of causes, like many, many, many. And Rachel showed a slide with all these different genes that can result in dystonia. One of the causes of dystonia is Parkinson's disease, okay? So just to make everybody a little confused, Parkinson's can cause dystonia, either because it's an early sign, and we have some patients whose Parkinson's began as writer's cramp or foot dystonia, especially foot dystonia, but dystonia can also occur as a side effect of the treatment. So you can get that, you can get, you, so dystonia is part of the PD 
Parkinson's disease picture. And that's because the two, the dystonia and the Parkinson's, which is usually we think of that as slow movement and tremor and stiffness, share problems with this circuitry that Dr. Jimenez Shahed was talking about that we perturb when we do DBS. So in fact, DBS works for dystonia and DBS works for Parkinson's. How is that possible? And we even target the same target. And it's because this circuit controls is, is very important for motor control. And when it's malfunctioning, you can end up with dystonia or Parkinson's and you can fix it with DBS. So that's the long answer for that. As far as essential tremor is concerned, essential tremor really is a different condition from Parkinson's, okay? They, they are different, but sometimes can be confused because you can have tremor as the first feature of Parkinson's disease and tr essential tremor is marked by tremor. And so usually we don't have a big problem separating the two, but sometimes they can be a little confusing. And so we do something called a DAT scan. We can do a scan looking at dopamine transporter and sometimes that can help us distinguish, but we're such fabulous clinicians. We, we think that we, we don't really need to do that. But there is some data actually that, and we know this, there's more than some data, that a subgroup of people with essential tremor do go on to develop PD, Parkinson's disease. So, and so there is a connection there for sure. Most people with essential tremor don't have Parkinson's, but that can be you just not uncommonly in our patients, there's this early history of essential tremor. So they are connected, although we haven't really figured out why, why that happens. It sounds like that gets to the whole heterogeneity of Parkinson's. This is not one disease and this no, pursuit no. of personalized medicine. No, and going back many years, actually this was Rachel's husband, going back many years, we were really interested in whether people who had essential tremor and then developed Parkinson's were different than the rest of everybody with Parkinson's, and they probably are. So again, personalized heterogeneity, exactly. Uh, I might try and get at least two more questions, but I, one I think is important to a lot of people going to Dr. Yemenez Shahed asking, we've obviously talked a lot about deep brain stimulation in general, as well as your work in particular. Can you speak to some of the dangers of DBS as it exists right now and how your work dovetails into ameliorating those? Yeah, so I think, you know, deep brain stimulation is a surgical therapy, right? And, and not only that, it's a brain surgery. So we so, totally understand, um, you know, some trepidation that people might have about undergoing a brain surgery to treat their uh, Parkinson's disease. Having said that, as far as brain surgeries are concerned, this actually is one of the safer types of brain surgeries. We're not going in and cutting things out. We're not um, you know, damaging, hopefully, anything when we are placing these deep brain stimulation devices and for all intents and purposes, implanting the hardware is actually a reversible process. Um, so having said that, I mean, it is, like I said, brain surgery, we are putting things in there. There are uh, some potential risks associated with that type of procedure. People may have headaches, they might have seizures, they might have strokes, they might, um, you know, have uh, difficulties with excessive movements just in the, operative, the, the kind of perioperative period, there might be risk of infection. Um, but thankfully, you know, in the hands of experienced surgeons, such as we have here at our center, uh, these risks are very low. And we do a lot of different things um, in our pre-operative assessment, as well as in the OR itself to really kind of minimize those risks and to ensure that we're handling uh, patients in the, in the most safest way as possible. And so our, our risk rate for that is actually very low. Excellent. Well, we are at five o'clock. So let me formally thank all of our panelists and for all of you who tuned in. We will try to answer whatever questions we didn't get to. Uh, we'll try and get you answers uh, after uh, in the next uh, several days. Again, uh, this is our QR code. If you're inspired to donate to the center, uh, obviously we have, we have amazing talent, as you've heard, and a lot of work to do. Uh, a lot of the answers to the questions actually were, uh, we don't know yet, we need to do more research. Uh, and so that's where your support can really make a huge difference. You can point your smartphone at this flow code, uh, which will remain up for a period of time. 
But again, thank you to all of our wonderful panelists, not only for this these talks, but of course, the amazing patient care training and research that you do every day. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day.